it is amazing grace. And it's not just that he saved us once, but he's continuing to save us. That same grace that saved us from our sin and from death will save us in the end when Jesus returns, like we looked at this morning in Sunday school. And it's saving us day by day that God's grace is just that amazing, that it's not a one-time event that is every day of our life. We can see how great and how amazing God's love and his grace is for us. And so I invite you to go ahead and turn with me to, to Ruth chapter 4. We're going to pick up where we left off a few weeks ago. And uh, But before we start, uh, just, you know, me and Crystal, we both love to be around the water, whether it's a lake, whether it's the ocean, a river, we love to be around uh, the water. You know, I like to, to find some shade and sit there and look at the water. Crystal doesn't care if they're shade or not. She just wants to soak up the sun and be close to the water. Our kids love it as well. They love playing in the sand, swimming. You know, our whole family loves being near it. But it also, we I just like to look at it. And I, I think it's just an amazing thing that that every little thing that hits the water leaves a ripple. You know, sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small. You know, the, the waves of the ocean, there's just this calming effect that it brings, but also just knowing that, that every little thing or big thing that touches the water, it's going to leave behind some effect, some ripple, some, some wake. Uh, and so, and just like everything, whether it's big or small, that hits the water leaves behind a wake, I think we also leave behind our own wake or our own legacy. And that's what I want us to think about this morning as we continue to look at the book of Ruth. And, and what, what is your personal legacy? And what is the legacy or the wake that, that Salem Baptist Church is leaving behind? Is it a tiny ripple that no one notices? Or is it a giant wave that is sweeping through and touching people's lives? through the grace and the love of God. And so I want us to, to think about the question this morning of what will you be known for? And so not just you as an individual, but also us as a church. What will Salem Baptist Church be known for? When it's all said and done, what will our legacy be? And so I want us to pick up in Ruth chapter 4. But since it's been a couple of weeks, I want to kind of recap where we've come in the story of Ruth. And so we know in chapter 1 uh, that Ruth, we find Ruth in, in Naomi in Moab because they left Naomi's family, Elimelech, Malon, Chilion. They left Bethlehem because of the famine. They went to Moab where there was food. And during that time there, they were there at least 10 years. Both Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Then Ruth's husband died, and also Orpah, Naomi's other daughter-in-law, her husband died. So Naomi is left alone with just her two daughters-in-law. Her husband died, both of her children are died, but in the end of chapter 1, she hears the news that the famine is ending. The famine that drove them out of Bethlehem is coming to an end. And so she begins to make plans to return to Bethlehem, and she's trying to get Ruth and, and Orpah to stay behind, but and Ruth doesn't want to abandon her. She goes with her all the way back, but Orpah decides it is better for her to return to what is known, to return to her homeland in Moab. Then chapter 2, we pick up with Ruth and Naomi. They're in Bethlehem, and we see the story of how God miraculously and providentially provides for both of them through uh, through the man named Boaz, who is, who is willing to, and kind enough to let Ruth glean in his field and not only just take what she can find, but he's giving her, he's giving her an abundance of grain. And then chapter 3, the, the story kind of shifts from them just, just trying to survive to where no, Naomi comes up with this plan to find Ruth a permanent home, to find her a husband. And so Naomi thinks up the plan and Ruth puts it into action and she goes to Boaz and she requests not only that he allow her to continue to glean in his field, but she boldly asks for him to take her as his wife. 
and Boaz graciously agrees and he's actually excited to be able to marry someone as kind and as full of character as Ruth is. And then that's where we pick up in this story in chapter 4. But Boaz is wanting to redeem Ruth. He's wanting to marry Ruth. But there's one problem. There's one nearer redeemer, as Boaz says. Someone else who has the opportunity to marry Ruth before he does. And so that's what I want us to pick up in Ruth chapter 4. But before we read it, as we just kind of recapped it, I also want us to, to keep in the back of our mind kind of the progression of action as we're moving through this story. You know, in chapter 1, we don't see a whole lot of God really in the book of Ruth as, as the main character, as the main actor. He doesn't really speak. He's not, he's there in the background. We know he's always working, but he doesn't portray himself, and the narrator doesn't portray God as, as ever the main actor. But in chapter 1, we see God is, is taking action, or at least allowing events to happen. He allowed the famine that hit Bethlehem to happen. We don't know if he caused it, but because he is sovereign, because he is God, he allowed it to take place. Again, we don't know if he directly caused the deaths of Elimelech and Malon and Chilion. But again, because he is sovereign and in control of everything... He allowed those events, those deaths to take place. And even Naomi says she sees God's hand directly involved in her situation. It is God who has made her life bitter, as she says in chapter 1. And she can't see the end of the story, but she understands that God is involved in her life, that he is acting. And so we know that God begins the story. Um, and then we, we continue to read in chapter 1, and it's more of Naomi who kind of picks up the action. She hears that the famine is ending. She decides that she's going to go back to Bethlehem. She's trying to persuade Ruth and Orpah to stay back. And so chapter 1, God starts, and then Naomi kind of takes over, and then we get to chapter 2, and it shifts more to Ruth as being the main actor. And she is asking Naomi, let me go and work. I want to go and work and provide. And then all through chapter 2, Ruth is the main, main actor in the story. We get to chapter 3, and it's, it kind of shifts back to Naomi for just a minute as she comes up with this plan to try to provide Ruth a permanent husband. And then Ruth again takes over, and she puts that plan into action. And then towards the end of chapter 3, we see that Boaz becomes the main character. He is promising to find a redeemer for Ruth, whether it is himself or whether it is this nearer redeemer. And so as we continue looking at this story, we're not sure at this point how it's going to end. Is Boaz going to be able to redeem Ruth like he wants? Is the nearer redeemer going to redeem Ruth? We don't know how it's going to end. But we see this progression of action that that almost every chapter has a different main actor. And we pick up in Ruth chapter 4, and Boaz is still the main actor. And so read with me. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. It says, Boaz went to the gate of the town, and he sat down there. And soon the family redeemer Boaz had spoken about came by. Boaz, Boaz said, come over here and sit down. So he went over, and he sat down. Then Boaz took ten men of the town's elders, and he said, Sit here, and they sat down. And he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who is returned from the territory of Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you, buy it back in the presence of those seated here, and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, then do it. But if you don't want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know, because there isn't anyone other than you to redeem it, and I am the next after you. I want to redeem it, he answered. And then Boaz said, On the day that you buy the field from Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to 
to perpetuate the man's name on his property. And the Redeemer replied, I can't redeem it myself, or I will ruin my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption, because I can't redeem it. And at an earlier period in Israel, a man removed his sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make any matter legally binding concerning the right of redemption or the exchange of property. <laughs> this was the method of legally binding a transaction in Israel. So the Redeemer removed his sandal and said to Boaz, Buy back the property yourself. So Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Chilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, Malon's widow, widow as my wife, to perpetuate the deceased man's name on his property, so that his name will not disappear among his relatives or from the gate of his hometown. You are witnesses today. Now all the people who were at the city gate, including the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful in Epatherath, and your name well known in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. And so we're starting to see this glimmer of hope come out of this story. We don't know how, uh, prior to chapter 4, we don't know how it's all going to end, and we still don't have the full picture of how this story resolves. But we've got this sense of hope that one way or another, Ruth is going to be redeemed. One way or another, Naomi's family is going to be provided for. Boaz picks up in, in verse 1, fulfilling the promise that he made to Ruth in chapter 3. He said, I'm going to take care of this today or in the morning. And so that, morning, that night when she, she went to the threshing floor and she asked him to marry her, you know, he said, wait here until morning, and in the morning I will go and I will see if this other Redeemer wants to redeem you. If he does, he can. If not, I will. And so Boaz is keeping true to his word. He gets up and says, early in the morning, he gets up and he went straight to the city gate of the town. And, and when he went to the gate of the town, it's that is where business would be handled. That is where... Um, especially anything that in, involved a legality would be handled was at the city gate. And so he goes straight to where he knows he's going to find not only this other redeemer, but he's going to find some witnesses that he's going to need to, to carry through with this, with this redemption. And so he goes there, and sure enough, he finds exactly the man that he's looking for, the nearer redeemer that Boaz had spoken about is coming by. And it's interesting how the narrator and how Boaz refer to this man. It says, uh, some of our English translations don't even refer to him as having a name or having or being called a friend. My version just says, come over here and sit down. Some translations say that he calls him friend. Friend, come here and sit down. The King James, I believe, says a certain one he called to him and he said, come and sit down. And so it's this, this phrase in, in Hebrew, it's actually more closely lined up with the King James. Or maybe it's, it could be morphed into a phrase, something similar to a certain friend that Boaz is calling. But he doesn't give him a name, whether Boaz or the narrator, they don't record his name. And the phrase in Hebrew is actually Peleni Almani. It's kind of a play on words that we can roughly translate as Mr. So-and-so. And so, and so Boaz is he's calling you, Mr. So-and-so, come over here and sit down. I've got something I want to discuss with you. And we're going to talk more about why in the world Boaz would refer to him, or as at least the narrator would refer to this man, as Mr. So-and-so. 
But either way, he calls him, he comes, he sits down. Boaz also goes to the trouble of gathering 10 elders from the city so that they've got witnesses. And once everybody is in place, he starts the discussion. He says, I've got something that I want to share with you. you you've probably heard about Naomi, who's come back from the land of Moab. She's got some property that she's selling, and you are the nearest family redeemer. Will you be interested in buying back this land? And so Mr. So-and-so, this near redeemer, he says, sure, you know, I will buy it back. But then Boaz says, but, but also you need to know that the day that you buy back the land, you're also going to redeem Ruth and Naomi's daughter-in-law and take her as your wife so that you can raise up a family for the deceased. And at this point, we don't really know why, but the, the near redeemer, Mr. So-and-so, as quickly as he said, yes, I want the land, when he finds out that there's more entailed, he, he quickly declines. He goes back and he says, no, I cannot redeem the land and I cannot redeem um, Ruth. It says that, I believe it's verse 6. He said, I can't redeem it myself, or I will ruin my own inheritance. And so he's more interested in taking care of his own estate. He's more interested in taking care of his own family than he is for providing for anyone else. So, so when he finds out that it that involves more than just land, he, he, he realizes that he's bitten off more than he can chew, and he says, no, I, I can't do this. You, Boaz, go ahead and take my right of redemption. And so and we can see three things from this about the blessings of the world from, from this Mr. So-and-so. And so one of the things that we see about the blessings of this world is that when we chase after the blessings of this world, it prohibits you from being able to bless others. And so when, he's, when this conversation is initiated, he seems to be excited about the idea that he can get some more land, that he's going to increase his property, that he's going to increase his estate. But the problem is he's thinking inwardly. He's thinking only about how it benefits him. And never once in this transaction does he refer to Ruth as a person? But the whole time he's talking about this, he's talking about it as a legal transaction where he's talking about it as property. He's not referring to Naomi's family. He's not referring to Ruth as a person, but he just sees this as a means that, that could possibly benefit his own inheritance. And when you chase after the blessings of this world, it's always going to leave you wanting more. It's never going to satisfy. He's interested in wanting to take on more in a way that might make him some extra money, but he's not willing to do the work and to provide for a hurting family and a hurting widow. And so chasing after the blessings of this world will prohibit you from blessing other people. We also see, uh, and this we're going to come back to why I believe the narrator calls him Mr. So-and-so is that chasing after the blessings of this world will lead to anonymity. You know, he's not referred, he's not given a name. He's not referred to even at this point as the Redeemer. All throughout chapter 3, Boaz says there's a nearer Redeemer. But at this point, he's just, he's left nameless. He's left as Mr. So-and-so, a certain one. And so what's the significance in that? It's it's the fact that he wasn't willing to redeem this hurting family. He wasn't willing to redeem Ruth, the widow. And so the narrator in this story is unwilling to even give him a name in the story. No, no quicker than does he appear on the scene as he is quickly fading into the background. And so the narrator is using this term as a term of judgment by saying, because you are not willing if we look at verse 6, again, he says, I will ruin my own inheritance. And if we go back up to verse 5, where Boaz says, On the day that you buy the field from Naomi, 
you will acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. And so, because this this near redeemer, this Mister So and So, is not willing to take care of this nameless family's needs. He's not willing to redeem Naomi's husband and Naomi's children, just as they are left nameless, just as they are left deceased. Mr. So-and-so now fades from the story, and he is left without a name. And so again, if we chase after the world's blessings, eventually it's going to be left. We're, it's going to lead us into anonymity. It's going to lead us down a path where no one really remembers us after a time. No matter how much wealth you may have, no matter how famous you may be, eventually the world is going to forget that you ever existed. And this is just a picture of how quickly <coughs> in the grand scheme of life that it can happen. He appears in verse 1, and by verse 5, he's disappeared. He's gone. Or by verse 6. Just like that, he disappears from the story. And if you are chasing after the world's blessings, you will disappear just as quickly. There's nothing that's going to be left behind of significance, of importance. Chasing after the world's blessings not only keeps you from blessing other people, but it's going to lead to a life of insignificance and being forgotten. And then the third thing that we can see about uh, about chasing after the blessings of this world is simply that it cannot save your soul. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the last section. But again, this nearer redeemer, Mr. So-and-so, he doesn't realize the blessing that could be involved with taking on Naomi's family, with marrying Ruth. He doesn't realize that that if he does this, if he redeems Ruth, that the Messiah could come through his line. He's, he's thinking more inwardly. He's thinking only about what he's going to benefit from it. And he misses the blessing of being able to be one who blesses future generations. And really, as God promised to Abraham, through you, I will bless everyone on the earth. And so Mr. So-and-so traded a little bit of land, a little bit of, of worldly wealth for this long-lasting legacy of being able to say that the Messiah came through his line. And so if we chase after the world's blessings, it's going to fail us. It's going to always leave you wanting more. It's going to lead you down a path that leads to anonymity. And ultimately, it's not going to be able to save your soul. But thankfully, the story doesn't end with verse 6. Let's look at how Boaz responds. And so we pick up in verse 9. And so no quicker than does Mr. So-and-so say, I can't redeem this property. I can't marry uh, this woman. And again, he doesn't even refer to her, to her as a person. He's referring to it as a transaction. No quickly does he say to Boaz, you redeem it. Then does Boaz turn to the elders and he says, Okay, you all are witnesses today that I am going to redeem, that I am going to buy back Naomi's land, and that I'm also going to redeem and take Ruth as my wife. He doesn't hesitate. He's not worried about what the repercussions might be. And again, we don't know what financial situation this other redeemer uh, was in, but we do know that he was unwilling to take on the responsibility of raising up children for Ruth. And it could be that if he married Ruth, and if they had children, and when those children grow up, that this land that he also bought back, it would pass back into uh, Ruth's child's name. So that their, as it says, so that their name is not forgotten. So when he realizes that he may not even be able to keep this land forever, he says, I can't do it. But Boaz isn't concerned with that. As soon as he gets the opportunity, he doesn't flinch. He doesn't hesitate. He says, today you are witnesses. I am buying the land, and I am taking Ruth as my wife. And so and then through this, we can see, and we're going to read verses 11 and 12. 
and we're going to see the witnesses, how they respond to this. And, and the way they respond, I think we can see the blessings of God. We've talked about what the blessings of this world, what chasing after them will lead to. But in, these, in the way the witnesses respond to Boaz, I believe we can see three things about the blessings of God. And so let's look at verses 11 and 12 again. It says, All the people who were at the city gate, including the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful in Epaphrath and your name well known in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. And so this, this group of ten, ten men, these, these elders, they're blessing Boaz. They're saying, because you are willing to do this, we want to pronounce a blessing to you. And, and through these blessings, we can see ten, the, three ways that, God, that the way God's blessings uh, <clears throat> pass to us. And the first one is in verse 11. They say, May the Lord make the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. And so God's blessings, God blesses with numerical abundance. We know that Rachel and Leah, they're credited with, with giving birth to the 12 tribes of Israel. And so these witnesses are saying, may Ruth, may this woman that you are marrying be like Rachel and Leah. May they be blessed abundantly. And so God gives numerical abundance in his blessings. We jump down to verse 12 and we see that it's actually the third blessing that they say. We're going to pick up on the second one in a minute. The verse 12 says that may your house become like the house of Perez, the son Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. And so all throughout scripture, in many places, Perez or the sons of Perez, they're referred to as strong and valiant men. And so another blessing, another way that the Lord blesses is through significance. God blesses through he blesses you with significance. He's not willing to let your name be forgotten. He's not going to, to see and to watch all the struggle that you're going with and just turn his back to you. He's going to bless you with a life that is important. He's going to bless you with significance. He gives the dead a new name. He takes us as his own children and he makes you a son or a daughter of the king. And so God blesses you not only with abundance, as we've seen throughout the story of Ruth, that he's going to meet your needs, not only with just enough to get by, but as we've seen with Ruth, he's provided over and above what is required, and really over and above what Ruth could ever expect or have dreamed of. So God blesses with abundance, but he also gives you a life of significance. You're not going to disappear from the story of God, uh, of history, like Mr. So-and-so, if you were chasing after the blessings of God. If you were chasing after him, he's going to give you a life of significance. And then sandwiched between these two blessings, that, that Ruth would be like the Rachel and Leah, and that may their house, Boaz and Ruth's house, be like the sons of Perez, we're sandwiched in between those two in the end of verse 11. It says, May you be powerful in Epaphrath, and your name well known in Bethlehem. And so God, <coughs> God blesses with renown. He doesn't let you live a life of insignificance. And, and really, where it says well known or renowned, it means that he is calling you to something important. He's calling you and appointing you to eternal life, to where your name will be written down forever and forever. Unlike Mr. So-and-so who didn't even get his name recorded in the Bible, if you chase after God and his blessings, 
your name will be written down in the Lamb's book of life forever and forever. And so God blesses with renown. He is pointing you and appointing you and giving you eternal life so that no matter what you are facing, the problems that you are facing now, the problems that you faced yesterday will all be but memories when you experience the amazing grace and the love that God gives through eternal life. And so as we think about how we can apply this, uh, we also see just the first glimmer or another glimmer of, of hope and resurrection in this story. And if we look closely, In verse 9, I'm going to read it again. It says, Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Chilion, and Malon. And you may just read that and, and just skim over the importance there, but it's important that this is the first time that Elimelech and Malon and Chilion are referred to with their name. You know, Malon and Chilion haven't been referred to with their name since all the way back in Ruth chapter 1 verse 5, when the narrator is telling us that they died in the land of Moab. Elimelech hasn't been mentioned since chapter 2 verse 3, when Boaz, when the narrator is telling us that Boaz, the, the, the man that Ruth began to work in his field, is also from Elimelech's family. The whole of chapter 2 and all of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, this family is referred to as the deceased. They're not given a name. But here in verse 9, Boaz gives them a name. He says, I am buying back everything that belonged to Elimelech, to Chilion, and to Malon. And just that important truth that, that what the world lets pass over and what lets die, God is slowly and surely bringing back to life. And so whether you find yourself more in the position of Boaz, where, you are, where God is wanting to use you to bless other people, or if you still find yourself more in Ruth's shoes, where you're not sure why, or in Naomi's shoes, where you're not sure why the world is being so hard on you, just know that from that very small truth in verse 9, that God is working behind the scenes to give the dead a name. He's bringing them back to life. And so as we think about how we can apply this, uh, I think for all of us, I want, to, I want to just challenge you to do what Boaz did if we go all the way back to verse 1 of this chapter. Chapter 4, verse 1. It said, Boaz went to the gate of the town or of the city. <coughs> and you're thinking, well, Big Spring doesn't have a gate. It doesn't have a wall. What, why am I going to go to the gate of Big Spring? And even if I could, even if there was a wall, we can't really go out and about like we did a month ago. Everything's been shut down. Uh, so what in the world can, how can we go to the gate of the town? But again, if we're thinking that Boaz went to the gate of this city, because that is where people were gathered. He knew that people were going to pass through that gate on their way to work into the field. He knew that Mr. So-and-so, there was a very good chance that he was going to pass by the gate at some point during the morning. He knew that was the best place that he could find witnesses. And so he went to where he knew there would be people. And so I want to encourage you as and us as a church to go where you know there will be people. And right now, that is online. And so I want to encourage you to go online. If you have a Facebook page, if you have a blog, if you have uh, some form of social media, I want to just encourage you to go there and to leave a Bible verse on your Facebook page. And we don't know how many people are going to see it. Maybe no one will see it. But I just want to encourage you to go to your Facebook page and write a Bible verse or leave a favorite Bible story that you have and just type it out so that the world can see, so that whoever might pass by can see the hope of God's Word. You know, maybe you need to invite one of your friends or, or send a text message or an email 
or even reach out by a phone call or a Facebook message to somebody that you know who is hurting or somebody that you know who isn't involved in a church, but maybe your Facebook friends with them. Just reach out and, and over a private message, ask them, how can you pray? How can I be praying for you this week? And because we never know what something so small as a Bible verse or a prayer might mean. You know, we've talked about how, you know, I, I try to do that when we go to restaurants, when we try to order, say, how can I pray for the waitress or the waiter? But now we can't even really do that. But I think going to your Facebook page or finding a friend that you know that may be far from God and just personally reaching out, that is how we can go to the gate of our city where even when people are shut down, we can go where there are people. And believe me, there are people online each and every minute of the day. And so again, we don't know how many people are gonna see it and maybe nobody will respond. But we know that just as God hasn't forgotten Naomi, he will see our good work and he will reward that even if he is the only audience that we are writing to. And so I want to just to challenge you, each of us, to do that. But again, if you are here and you feel like you're still in the situation of Ruth and Naomi, I just encourage you to continue to go to the Redeemer who is not going to refuse you. Mr. So-and-so wasn't willing to redeem Ruth when he found out that it involved caring for a person. But there is a Redeemer. There is one who is near you that is never going to turn his back on you. He's never going to fail you. He's never going to leave you in want. And so will you go to the Redeemer? And he has a name. Unlike Mr. So-and-so in this story, our Redeemer and your Redeemer has a name. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he is willing to save you. He's willing to overlook anything that you have done in your past or not done in your past. And he will redeem even your worst situations. Just like we see this little glimmer of hope in verse 9, that God is bringing the dead back to life. God can do that for your situation. The coronavirus will not have the last word. God is working behind the scenes to get the glory. Cancer will not have the last word. God is working behind the scenes in your life to make sure that he redeems your life and your soul and gives you a life of renown and eternal significance. Death itself will not have the last word because God has overcome death. And so whatever situation you find yourself in, I just ask that you would go to the Redeemer who has a name. Go to Jesus and give yourself to him because he will not fail you. He will always redeem you with blessings beyond what you can imagine. He will redeem you with a life of significance and he will appoint you to eternal life. So let me pray for us this morning.